well, that's, she's fun. <laughs> she's definitely fun. Hello, we're live. Can you believe it? Hi there. We're live in the flash. If only we could be in person together. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. I have two fabulous ladies who are joining our lovely panel discussion today. We have the amazingly talented Naveen Nas with Medical Screenings Unlimited. And we also have Sandra Rivas, who is an amazing, amazing uh, wellness, wellness uh, champion. She works for Humana and supports clients every day with making sure that their, their, the companies have really solid wellness programs for their employees and help them stay engaged in their well-being and health and all of those things. So we're going to have an amazing conversation today talking all about the multi-generational workforce and the challenges that employers need to be thinking about when they're trying to address these specific needs of each of these generational, um, multi-generational employees and how to navigate all of that. So Sandra, Naveen, welcome to the show today. So happy Thank to you. have you guys. Thank you. It's very yeah. exciting Thank to be you. here. Yeah. I was so I was love coming on your show. You have such a good energy. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. That's one thing that I don't lack. You can just ask my husband. Sometimes he's like, Nicole, can you just tone it down just a little bit? And I'm like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. So, um, but yeah, but like, I would love to just learn a little bit more about you, Sandra, and have you share with our audience just a little bit about yourself. And I want to start with a, my, my little icebreaker question. I asked sure. this to Naveen in one of our first shows when she came on, she probably remember it. Maybe she won't, or maybe it was, she'll know the question. I think when I say it, but if you could be an animal, what would be your spirit animal? Oh, that's easy. Definitely some type of bird, probably like an oh, eagle or something like that. Yeah, just the ability to fly and just good answer. whatever I want. I think that's amazing. The ability to fly and go wherever you want. Yeah. Yes. I love it. I remember I when I went to- I will tell you, that says a lot about her because she's covering a lot of ground. When you're a bird, you cover, and that's her. <laughs> that is Sandra. You cover a lot of ground. Yep. Good answer. Yep. Good answer. <laughs> that's amazing. Naveen can back it up. Yep. It reminds me of when I was in the Pacific Northwest and they have bald eagles all over the place there. And they're just like perched on the top of the, these trees. And they're like the kings. Like literally, they're just perched way up high, just looking over, scoping it all out. And it's just, and it's just amazing to see them when they fly. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. Keep flying, Sandra the Eagle. I love it. Thanks. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you got into the wellness industry. What inspired you? You have a very long history of wellness, but going back to your college days, you, you know, it looks like you studied exercise yeah. science when you were in college. So what inspired you as a younger girl to want to go into this industry and how has your journey evolved over time? Yeah, absolutely. So my background, like you mentioned, is in clinical exercise physiology and I started my goal, well, my, my started my career because my goal initially was to pursue a career in cardiac rehab. And I actually did an internship. I loved it. It was an amazing experience working at the hospital and meeting patients. But, you know, I realized as I was doing it that I was only meeting a really small portion of the people that have had cardiac events um, because unfortunately, you know, there are some people who don't have that second chance to go on and try to better their lives through behavioral changes. So, you know, I saw the patients that I was working with not only receive the cardiac rehab prescriptions, but also get nutrition education and get stress management tips. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, this would be amazing if they had received all of this education before they actually got to this stage where they had a heart attack or they had some other type of cardiac issue and are trying to you know, improve. So, you know, yeah. where, where can I work that would be able to get that message across? And um, considering that a lot of it is behavioral, how can I educate people? So, you know, thinking that we spend a big chunk of our waking hours at work, I figured workplace wellness is really a great place to do this. Um, employers have a captive audience. They're able to really spend the, spend the time with their employees to make sure that they're getting healthier. Um, and so that's really what drew me there. Amazing. I love it. And how important it is to address those challenges before they become challenges, right? And educating exactly. those young, the younger generations at a very young age so that they can develop those healthy habits really just helps them to live a much more full life long term, but also for the employers too, to have just a really healthy workforce too, that's just thriving. So that's awesome. 
Very cool. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the multi-generational workforce that we live in today. We've got baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen, you know, Gen Zers now coming up. It's hard to believe as a millennial that there's the Gen Z beyond me, honestly. I still like to feel like I'm <laughs> 22 years old and just yeah. starting my career, but that's not the I case agree. anymore. <laughs> right? So there's so many different needs. And I think like when you think about the baby boomers, for example, who grew up before the digital age, really, before cell phones and have had mm -hmm. to adopt technology, they're, you know, completely, you know, digital natives. Is that the is digital natives, I believe? But anyway, all the way down to the Gen Zers who are just like, they live on their cell phones. So the way that these generations like to communicate, the way they like to receive information really varies in the workforce. So let's talk a little bit about that. I'd love to just hear from you about um, this, this, this trend. Like, what are the common barriers that you see when it comes to addressing these challenges when it comes to wellness? Well, uh, there's definitely going to be a variety of them. And I would say one of the big things, you know, as as much as we tend to kind of group our, our, our generations into different boxes, you know, if we are adhering to stereotypes, that can also kind of put us in a little bit of a bind, too, because we have to realize that everybody is still an individual that, yes, they may share some common um, experiences with people in their generation. But at the end of the day, we're going to really have to kind of get to know that person to figure out what in their background, whether socioeconomic, geographic, cultural, all of that is really making them tick and really making them um, make the choices that they currently are and how we can improve that. Um, but I would say that a big thing, you know, definitely not having a lot of data. So not really getting to know the employees mm -hmm. and know what those issues are is going to definitely set people back. Um, and then not having clear goals based on that data. That's also going to be detrimental. So once you have those goals, once you have that data, then it's really just a matter of how do we reach all of these individuals? Yes, mm -hmm. consider them as a, as a generation and the, their preferred method of communication, um, but also ultimately how are they as individuals going to want to receive that information? Mm, so, so important. And I'm sure it just okay. runs runs the gamut. Naveen, I'd love to have you chime in. I know you've worked with Sandra for quite a while. Maybe you can share a little bit about your experience working with Sandra and how you guys have partnered together to support um, wellness for employers and especially addressing the needs of multi-generational workforce. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that with in the workforce, um, really wellness wasn't prevalent until like like the 70s. Mm -hmm. And when I got involved in the, in 96, I mean, there was a good 10 years that went by before we even were even, you know, you know, started addressing the individual and their accountability to the process, mm -hmm. you know, until, you know, for 10 years, we'd go out, we do the screening, they'd see us every year. Um, but there was really no change. There was no accountability. Um, but then in 2006, there was a federal regulation which authorized the contingent wellness programs. Um, offering incentives, um, which is what Humana is really huge on. Um, and, but it's to achieve the biometrics outcomes such as BMI and cholesterol. And then that is when we, I think, believe like we were able to engage with them before it was, we were providing something to them and they would leave, but they were had us, they had skin in the game. So they would then yeah. be engaging with us and we all had a plan and it was, you know, creating a baseline with the biometrics, but they knew that it was on them to make that change. Um, so, you know, I think that you know, programs have evolved over time and they're going to continue evolving. I mean, what we're doing today is still is, is irrelevant. Um, but, you know, initially the primary goal was to manage cost and mitigate risk. Um, and right. even though now we have the main focus is to have a healthy workforce, we're ending up with the same goal of managing cost and mitigating risk. So, but it's really everyone has, you know, you know, a say in it and the individual, um, you know, interacting with them and then their accountability is huge. It's huge. Yeah, I love I love what you said there because, you know, it's so important that they get the awareness of what their risks are through those biometric screenings. Sure. You know, that is the first yeah. step, right? They've got to be aware. Yeah. But that I think yeah. that what you shared is just that's not enough. There needs to be some engagement, some ongoing yeah. interventions to be able to help support them in that journey so that they're going to make those healthy changes. And it's going to happen intrinsically with it, you know, something that they're going to want to do. And so I think yeah. that's really cool how, you know, together you and Sandra have been able to create 
this really great partnership over yeah. the years where you can come and provide the awareness and then Sandra, Sandra and her team can help support the ongoing engagement of the employees. Exactly. So that, the initiative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that the partnership with Naveen, you know, aside from that initial just awareness of where they fall on, you know, with their health and, and what risks they may encounter in the future. Um, it's a really good first step to helping people become just more savvy healthcare consumers. If you think about it, you know, most people before they go out and buy anything, you know, be it a car, be it a, a TV, they do research, they go and see, you know, where's the best deal going to be where, you know, what's the best option for me and for my family. And they just don't go into it blindly. Whereas we really have not had that approach with healthcare in the past. And a lot of it has to do with how healthcare has been, um, has really been uh, executed in the past. Uh, but moving forward, you know, really, we want to encourage that and have people be part of that conversation. And like Naveen said, really just be accountable for it. So maybe they're hearing risk mitigation and they're only seeing it as an advantage to their employer. When in reality, it's going to impact them too, because we've never seen healthcare costs go down, right? On an annual basis, they're going <laughs> higher and higher and higher. People are paying more out of pocket. And so if yeah. they're able to really attenuate right. those risks before they're too big, they're going to impact their own pocket as well and just be healthier and happier overall. That is such a great point because I have to tell you on the employee side of things, I have heard friends who are part of wellness programs and they don't see that side of it, right? They're just seeing mm -hmm. the side of it as, oh, this is just so that my employer doesn't have to pay as much of a premium. But you're absolutely right that it does impact their their costs too. And it's important for the employees to recognize absolutely. that it is like a big joint effort in trying to, you know, it takes 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 a lot of effort on all sides, right? So yes. Very good. Awesome. I love that. So I would love to learn a little bit more, Naveen, if you could share a little bit, what have you noticed when it comes to wellness trends, how they have evolved over the years for different age groups? Have you noticed some ch challenges, differences when it comes to it, wellness? It, 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 it's into a new, when I was, yeah, yeah, with the topic, um, I was like, well, let me really redefine, like, what generation, like, what, what, how is it defined? we I guess, one, but I'm actually an old, 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 old generation. So ages one and I think finding health um, as we age, focusing on you know life prevention, holistic well-being. Whereas you know the age which is you know, six to fifty, they're the, they're the most stressed and time pressure generation. They're juggling multiple roles in the home, in the office, and you know with younger generation thirty. Five, which is where I see myself whenever I think of how old you, well, that's age I feel inside. So, but they're <laughs> most, you know, they're the most well, well conscious, you know, right? But they're the most mm -hmm. conscious and tech savvy generation. They're they grow up in a time of rapid change, innovation. Um, their, their health, their health is more of a lifestyle choice. I mean, how many of these mm -hmm. have at Thanksgiving? And they're purposely making these choices. It's not really a goal-driven activity, but you're also looking for wellness opportunities that can offer them fun, adventuralization. You know, they group classes, retreats, festivals. I mean, shout out on night adventure. Um, we're the group of generation. They're treading water. You know, they're interested in those programs that are going to you know offer flexibility, uh, you know, convenience, affordability. They're they're more willing to do the online apps, the you know the, the online platforms, the wearable devices. But you know, they're also seeking you know wellness experiences that will create an opportunity to relax, rejuvenate, and really escape their daily lives. And so with my generation, we're coasting. We've got it all figured out. I mean, no, we don't. We, but you know, I think that I think we're looking more for more ways to stay active. You know, engaged, um, relevant, socially connected. Um, you know, perhaps like maybe volunteering, continuing education, higher education. In my case, traveling. I mean, this is the first time that I've been able to go. Hey, yeah, we do ski trips and all that with the family and stuff. But it's the first time I've been able to look up and go. What do I want to do? What it, I'm at a point in my life that I'm looking at retirement up in 65 at 65, and um, or maybe before then. But I really want to take this opportunity now to really set what my future is going to look like. And really, I think you know the older generation is really focused on that. And for me, it's it's travel. So I think that we you know just really have to understand, like Sandra said, understand each 
each and each every uh, generation, but also listen to them. You know, the needs assessment, I said this before, needs assessment, figuring out what it is their needs are, but really put it in, putting it into action because they're not really going to feel that they were seen or heard or that speaks to them. So. Mm. I love that, Naveen. Sandra, is there anything that you wanted to add there when it comes to kind of some of the unique needs of oh, she has generation? plenty. She has so much good stuff. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you did a really good job, I think, uh, touching on some of those differences. And um, the one thing that, you know, I will want to say is that regardless, each generation, regardless of each of the needs of the generations, because they're going to have different ways of wanting to receive communication and, and different goals, depending on what their stage in life is. And we need to keep that in mind as we're putting together a, a wellness program. You know, if we think about our own personal lives and how our own wellness journeys evolve from, you know, when you're younger, financial security means one thing. And when you're older, it means another. Initially, it may be, you know, maybe it's funding for school or tuition reimbursement, or it's just getting an emergency savings going. And then as you're nearing retirement, your focus is making sure that you're ready for retirement. So how it's going to be just a broad spectrum depending on what those generations are. But Naveen, you, you did touch on a common thread that I think that all of the generations have, and that's that need for connection. So making sure that we are finding a way to keep everyone connected is going to be a huge way of making sure that we're hitting all of those, uh, the, main, the main needs for each of our generations and leading to a successful wellness program. Mm, I love what you said there about connection, Sandra. I think that's a really good and very important point. And it, it ties into this whole idea of communication, you know, how yes. these different generations prefer to communicate can really, you, you have to know and understand how they like to communicate, what their preferences are and what the challenges are there so that you can address those. Because if sure. the employees aren't getting the information adequately, that can lead to problems. I was just reading a statistic that when employees feel they've received adequate information, they're nearly three times likely, three, three times less likely to feel burned out and nearly mm -hmm. two times as likely to feel engaged in their work. And that's purely wow. communication. That comes all down to just, you know, feeling like they've received adequate information. Exactly. And so that, I think that ties really well into wellness is how can you, as an employer, really, as Naveen mentioned, do a really great needs assessment up front before you even start a wellness initiative, wellness mm -hmm. program, like as a first step doing that needs assessment in marketing, we call it a customer needs assessment too. It's like critical. You got to know what their problems are and pain points are and using that, leveraging that to understand their communication preferences. So <laughs> yeah. when you're I can't well see them. I can see you. <laughs> Hi, Naveen. We, we missed you. I know, I know we I lost you. You're having a little bit of a, you got to love technology, right? There's always, there's always something. There's always something, especially when you go live, we're, we're just making it work on the fly. <laughs> we were just talking Naveen about just the communication challenges and how to address those by understanding what they are when you do that initial needs assessment so that when you're building out your wellness program, you can address yes. them. So is there anything that you wanted to add there, Sandra, about communication? And I, you know, I was not familiar with that stat, but I can absolutely see that in practice on a daily basis. Um, mm -hmm. We have many employees who reach out saying, you know, I did not know this was available and this would have made such a huge difference. And a lot of it is how these things are being communicated to them or not, you know, not being communicated to them. So, wow. you know, it may take a, a few times for someone to see a message because perhaps it was emailed to them originally, but they don't really check their email or they're not checking their personal email. Maybe they're only checking their work email. Um, these are all things yeah. that you have to account for when you're putting together a communication plan to your employees and figuring out what's the best way. For some, it may be digital. For some, it may be in person still, or it could be something as simple as a flyer. Um, these are all different things that have to be accounted for. Yeah, absolutely. I love what you said there. And it's really about meeting them where they are so that they can right. engage, right? Rather yeah. than expecting them to come here, like if you're, for example, with the biometric screening event, you know, giving them options. So maybe if you have a, a really large remote workforce, doing an on-site screening is not going to make sense. Or maybe you do both and you have on-site screenings, but you also offer the option for them to go, you know, off-site or do a home test kit option. So it's really being able to understand you know, you know, how you can reach them so that they're not having to, you know, as much as possible, you're meeting them where they are in that journey. Exactly. Naveen, you're back. We missed you. 
I'm back. <laughs> you know, so I take it, I take it back. I take it back. I don't want to be part of the generation that's tech savvy because all I did was touch my earpiece <laughs> and it shut me down. <laughs> beats. I got these beats. I'm like, I'm relevant. I have beats, but I don't know how to use them. <laughs> All right, so I'm the older generation, technically, uh, officially. Oh, oh man. <laughs> so, but I, I'm generation. sure that while I was gone, Sandra, yeah, she touched on everything because we're really, I think we're, she and I are really in lockstep with what we believe on this, the generational, um, you know, you know, baselines and, you know, creating programs and really listening and, and implementing programs. So I'm excited that, thank you. So continue. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just love to hear, Sandra, if you have maybe an example of a client you've worked with that has really done a great job of addressing these multi-generational challenges in a good way. Like what did that, what did they, how did they set up their wellness program? Or maybe what do you recommend? Uh, maybe if you could walk us through and tell us a story of where you've seen this really implemented well in practice. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you, I've worked with hundreds of employers who have um, either attempted or have successfully implemented wellness programs. And there's been varying degrees of, of those outcomes. And some of the common threads that I've seen with them, there's there's probably three main things that I usually would say are, are going to be key factors. And the first is going to be leadership buy-in, because yeah. we all know that that sets the tone for everything at it, 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 the culture in a, in a workforce and uh, in a workplace. And so if you don't have a leadership that's bought in, then unfortunately, you're not really going to see that go down, you know, go down the ladder to where everyone else is going to be bought into this as well. So, you know, a lot of it is going to be how am I communicating to the executives or the senior leaders in my organization to really get them to understand the importance of having a wellness program um, or really just kind of shifting the, the focus of the, or, of, the, of the organizational culture towards being more uh, wellness oriented. Um, the second thing that I would say really makes people successful is going to be having wellness champions or some type of committee. You know, everyone needs cheerleaders to make sure that it's successful. You can get the program going, you can get it started, but if you don't have somebody out there that's telling their peers, this program is awesome. You know, not only am I getting healthier, I'm getting more steps or my cholesterol has gone down, but there's incentives involved. I've gotten gift cards or, you know, it, it's just been really great, a great experience for me. You should give it a try if you haven't already. And with that, that is a huge component of being successful. Um, and then having some type of committee or, or those champions getting together and sharing feedback on a regular basis of what they're hearing from their peers. You know, maybe, you know, we found out from a lot of people that, wellness programs are not necessarily um, accepted, not just because people aren't familiar with them or the communication, but they're a little wary of the fact that their employer wants them to be healthier. But if we can get past that communication barrier and explain to them that there are benefits involved, then that's going to be huge and a real, really critical piece of having a successful program. Um, and then the last and most yeah. important is having a clear direction. You know, you would never just kind of set off in your car or, or wherever, not really knowing where you're going, not having a destination in mind. And it's going to be the same thing when you're creating a program. You have to have a clear goal. Um, it's not enough to just put together, you know, let's let's do a weight loss program for the holidays mm -hmm. or um, let's all get together and, and do a, a step challenge. Those, those things are great by all means. It's a great way to develop camaraderie. But if there isn't an end goal in mind, then there really isn't a purpose to doing those things. Mm. And so that's going to yeah. be the main thing. I love that. So important to set a goal so that you know what you're measuring against. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think what you mentioned about wellness champions is so huge yeah. because I love what you said about, you know, people that can be a little bit wary about participating yeah. in a wellness program at first, but if they see their peers doing it and they see that their peers yeah. and their friends are engaged in it, that is going to be an easier way for them to get excited and bought into it rather than feeling like it's coming from way up here. But yeah, you know, if you have exactly. people on your team that are yeah. involved, go ahead, Naveen. Yeah. And you know, Sandra, Sandra, to your point, and also then, cause you nailed it as well. Um, what stuck out to me was the wellness champions. Um, mm -hmm. we, I've even gone as far as to like recommend going, Hey, listen, 
you're the wellness champion, but you need people that are championing what you're doing. And so it's like, Hey, the first 10% that sign up for the biometrics, they're going to get a blah, blah, blah. It's first of all, it's them, you know, they have credibility with their, you know, they're helping the champion, but they're also being, everyone's like, oh, let me get to, am I the first 10%? I don't know. You don't, I would say, don't do the first, Hey, the first five that sign up, they're like, Oh, I'm not going to get it. But it, they don't know the percentage. She say, okay, for the first 10% of people that sign up, you're going to get a $5 subway card. And they, they're going to be the ones that are working for you. So it's work smart, you know, not, you know, so it's, uh, you know, getting wellness champions or minions under you to uh, kind of implement what you're trying to achieve, because you got to keep your eye on the ball, but you really do need help. And people, you have the same people at, every time we go out that are signing up during getting engaged, you want, you want to activate them. You want to activate the cell and, and get them excited in their own cubicles to be talking about, hey, this is what I did. This is what I'm doing. Um, and just really kind of having, you know, a wellness workforce. So, right. Good, good points. Good points. Yeah. And I know you, you definitely nailed it with their needing help because we realize that HR teams have so many things on their plate and usually wellness just kind of falls on their plate in, in addition to everything else and when you're looking at the the hierarchy of the things that they need to get through a lot of times it's not up there because they have way more pressing issues you know benefits is not the end all as much as as i would love to think that it's really important <laughs> because that's the world that i work in they've got a lot of other things that are competing priorities and so having that additional help really helps alleviate that burden um, and just having people come together, you know, like-minded individuals, um, sharing feedback, coming up with ideas and really great ways to reach their employees uh, or reach their peers. That's that's going to be huge. Definitely makes a big difference. I agree. I agree. I agree. I love that. I love what you said too, Naveen, about like, I, who do, how do I, how, if, if I'm an employer, how do I know who's going to be a good wellness champion, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be a, a great person that I, that I can task or do this. And what I heard from you, Naveen, is to identify those folks that are already really engaged and excited about wellness yeah. and participating. Do you guys have any exactly. other suggestions? You know, a lot of our audience are manufacturers. And for manufacturers, do you have any suggestions, for example, for those folks who are building out their wellness program in terms of how do they get that leadership buy-in and how do they identify their wellness champions internally? Yeah. You know, I think I touched on this before, I think in another podcast maybe, but it's, you know, and, and Sandra just nailed it as well. It's almost like she's in my head. Um, it's, it's, needs, it's, it's it, yeah, it's sending out a needs assessment and in what she said about having, you know, from, you know, top tier down uh, approval um, to get, like I said, to get flexible um, with schedules. Cause you've got people that are on the line. You can't leave their schedule shifts changes. I mean, it's a 24 hour shift sometimes. And are we going to, is the shift going to cover when we're there? So it's really, you know, having the upper management allowing you to get creative and and then also implementing it because I mean you can get you can have all the plans in the world, but if you don't have the implementation power, we're just spinning our wheels. So I think that you you kind of nailed it, Sandra. Very good. We've got we got a few folks in the audience. We've got Yamalet Ramirez. I hope I said her name right. Right um, here, and we also have Sanjay who says Bravo and best wishes to all. Thank you for being here today, Sanjay. We appreciate you. This is such an awesome conversation. Thank you. So let's keep going. Let's talk more sure. about, um, uh, let's see, with the rise of remote work that we're seeing, especially post pandemic. And I know there's been some shift almost back. Like, it's so interesting. Like during COVID, there was, of course, this massive shift to remote work. And then after COVID, a lot of employers are now kind of like, well, there's definitely some downsides to remote work. So a lot of employers are saying, let's go back to the office because there's some, mm -hmm. you, you have some challenges there too. Yeah. But what do you see, what are you guys seeing on the wellness side with wellness trends that are adapting to, you know, this remote work phenomenon um, and how they're addressing those challenges for like the younger tech savvy employees versus older generations who sure. maybe aren't used to working remotely and all the technology that's involved? You know, I've seen a lot of employers really handle this challenge with with grace and just it's, it's mm -hmm. been amazing. Um, as I'm seeing some of the trends out there, um, I've seen a lot of their benefits offerings that they're putting together, really doing a good job of encompassing the whole spectrum of things that would target Gen Z all the way to their boomers or, or I mean, even traditionalists, because there are still some silent geners out there that are in the workforce. Um, and so making sure that they're catering to everybody in there. 
Um, and one of the things that I have to say I'm really excited about that I think has been such an amazing trend is employers offering a wellness stipend. Because in the mm -hmm. past, you know, we saw things like gym memberships being offered or, you know, catered lunches or things like that. But some of those things only work for people on site. And then some of the things are very specific to a certain demographic or a need of a, of a particular mm -hmm. individual. But if you're just offering a very general wellness stipend, you're giving an employer, an employee X amount of dollars to spend on a monthly basis for their wellness, that's huge because they can really choose how they're going to personalize that stipend. Some people may still opt for paying for a gym membership. Then you've got others who are going to pay for um, maybe that, that can go towards massage therapy or it can go towards some type of hobby or activity that really makes them feel better about themselves. So I'm, I'm excited about that trend. I would love to see employers adopting things of that nature where it's more flexible for their employees, because I think that's going to be the key moving forward is just flexibility in general in not only just your benefit offerings, but Every the way that you're putting together your approach to communication, like we've mentioned before, um, that's that's going to be, I think, the the buzzword for the coming years. I love that. So, any employers out there, if you're a leader in HR at a manufacturing company, this is, I think, such an amazing point, Sandra, that you've made is making sure that you're baking flexibility into your wellness program so that yeah. you can address those multi generational needs and really meet those employees where they are. Because we know that as time goes on that things are going to just get more complex with the way that we're working, how we're working, hybrid workplace, you know, or, you know, people are hoteling to their office and there's going to be so many more, I think, complexities in how we work in the future as we look forward that really thinking about how you can make it flexible rather than this fixed um, offering that, that can be limiting, I think is huge, is a very huge point. And we have a, we have a comment from Yamalette Ramirez. She says onsite wellness clinics is becoming more popular. Yes. easier access and more in-person access to the medical professionals. I love that. Sandra, what do you think about that? What's your, what's your response to this comment? I agree. And thank you, Yamilet, for sharing that. That is absolutely the case. Um, we are seeing that happen. And that's a great way to really make sure that you're hitting the health needs of all your generations. And this is particularly important because of the fact that each of them has a different relationship with healthcare. And so traditionally we see boomers um, being very open and having a, a, a usually a pretty good relationship with a primary care provider. Many of them have been going to the same doctor for years and they're just very comfortable going to that doctor for a lot of their needs. But then you have um, Gen X who is um, a little more skeptical and they're going out there and again, their time is limited. So they're trying to make the most of that and visiting providers that are going to be convenient for them. And then a trend that we're seeing with millennials and Gen Zers is that they're a little bit, they're, they're not a little bit, they're much more skeptical of traditional healthcare. And so they're mm -hmm. more likely to do things that are going to be convenient to them, that are going to be digital, that, you know, that they don't necessarily um, put as much of an emphasis on having that relationship with a particular provider, so much as having easy access to care. Um, and being able to get it at their fingertips. So if they're doing that on site at a workplace, that's a great way to to really speak to multiple generations at once. Um, and then I'm seeing that Yamila is also talking about mental health alternatives and motivational speakers. Absolutely, all of those are a huge part of it. We're seeing, you know, really just more of a holistic approach to uh, wellness offerings in general. I love that. Naveen, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think to your point, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not just about physical health anymore. It's about mental, mm -hmm. emotional, spiritual, social. I mean, similar to like, and again, biometrics, cause that's my world, but um, similar to like with biometrics, all the numbers come together, but if you can shift the BMI, you can't do anything about your height. You can do something about your weight, but when you, when the, that weight, when it shifts, all the other numbers kind of are affected and so yeah. um, you really just only have to move the needle one way. So when we're talking about the, you know, being social, I think social, being social really helps with your mental state, your emotional state, mm -hmm. your spiritual state, because you're engaged with your community. And, and I think that, it, you know, again, it's not, it's not a one-stop shop. It's not, you know, every, there's, it's not a one size fits all to your point. So it just, I, I think that you nailed it. Yeah, we know that mental health is continues to be a growing challenge um, for all generations um, going forward. So I, I love that. 
We've got another comment from Christopher Alvey. Hi, Christopher. Welcome to the show. He says, telemedicine has also been a hot trend for providing access to acute and behavioral health care. What do you guys think about telemedicine? I know I'm sh that became huge during COVID, huge acceleration yes. adoption there. Are you seeing that that's continuing to accelerate as an option that um, employers are offering as a, a service? What are you seeing trends there that that you think are important for us to be thinking about? Absolutely. Yeah, those are, those are definitely, um, we're starting to see those trends as well. Um, there was a real increase, obviously, during COVID with everything being on lockdown. It was just much easier. So I think that kind of helped accelerate that the util utilization of telemedicine. Um, then we saw a little bit of a drop after COVID, after mm -hmm. the lockdowns, people started going back to their traditional methods of, you know, of, of seeking out health care. But, you know, we've been seeing a steady increase as well. And there's lots of offerings. So for an example, at Humana, um, we've been doing things like um, telemedicine with behavioral and physical health care for quite some time. But even in the past year, we've actually implemented teledentistry, which is really exciting. So oh, dental really? are I didn't being know that. Unique. Yeah, it's it's really That's it's cool. a really great service for people who may have um, an you know urgent need for care. You know, maybe yeah. it's the middle of the night, all of a sudden they've got a toothache, they don't know why it's happening, and rather than to rush to an ER they can actually consult with a virtual dentist. That dentist can tell them whether they do need to go to an ER or if they can wait to see their dentist, they can prescribe them with medication. So there's lots of different trends. We're seeing mental health um, as a big service uh, or a big part of those services as well. When it comes to telemedicine, I think that people have been more, are more comfortable opening up to somebody when they're, they've got that, that, protection of having that screen in between them. So that's just a big benefit as well um, of, of the telemedicine services. I yeah. love that. So are you seeing that there's kind of like more interest from employees for like talk therapy, digital talk therapy, where they can speak with someone through an app kind of situation? Like what are you seeing there when it comes to utilization of some of those services? Absolutely. Yeah, we're definitely seeing uh, more and more in the industry that people are utilizing and, and, and we're starting to see an increase of those providers available, too. So if you look, you know, I'm sure if, if you watch YouTube or, or you're on Instagram or any other social media, you'll see a lot of ads for different mental health providers out there um, that are that are moving digitally. And it's as simple as having an app, you know, in your in your phone that you can access whenever you may feel a need, or you can have recurring appointments set up. And for people who are already just so connected to their phones and their computers, mm -hmm. that just makes it so much easier to be able to hop on really quick and, and speak to somebody when they really have that need. I love that. And are you seeing any other new kind of up and coming trends when it comes to how to address mental health? Um, for the workforce that you think are like kind of just like cutting edge that you see in increasing over in the next five, 10 years in terms of adoption and utilization? Yeah, well, one thing that I will say that's really interesting um, about the way the mental health trends are moving are um, we all as a generation, different, different generations have different needs. Yes. But at the, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, we have a common thread and that's just how, how we feel wellness and wellness really to each generation may change. But at the end of the day, when our goals, like what we, the picture of what we have in our head actually aligns with what our reality is. I mean, that's going to determine wellness. So finding, yeah. finding the, the services. That. So can you say that one more time? I got to stop. That was brilliant. Sure. <laughs> that was the picture of what is in your head. Yeah. So whatever you're picturing in terms of wellness and your goals, once that aligns with what your reality is, then that's what determines your your well-being, your what your status, what your wellness status is currently. I love that. Well said. Well said. That is so brilliant. You've inspired. <laughs> you've inspired Nicole. She's like, look at the all the lights are on. I <laughs> What a great way yeah. to measure your well-being, like for any individual to just say, how well am I? You know, how how do I feel like my well-being is? Is, right. the, you know, the image I have matching up with the reality of my life. That is so cool. Sorry, I just had to stop. That that was. Oh, no, 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 that's really good. That. I, you know, <laughs> I think that that's that's huge for a lot of people is, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they've never really taken inventory of that before and, yeah. you know, where they are. And so figuring out, well, what's missing to get there? Um, yes. And again, this kind of ties back to that needs assessment that Naveen mm -hmm. and you have mentioned.
but employers also need to do some digging to figure out what those needs are for their workforce. And, um, you know, just as important is for them to also figure out what their business goals are and then find some place in the middle, find that overlap, mm -hmm. making okay. sure that, yes, you are following through with the surveys because to Naveen's point, um, I think it's maddening for employees to get all these constant surveys and then not see any follow through because it doesn't make them feel valued or heard. Right. But if you right. are following up and providing something that actually aligns with what their needs are, then that goes a long way to making sure that you're addressing that mental health aspect of, yeah. of well-being. You know, I think I also, I think also with the mental health and like, you know, we're, it, us as Americans, we're like, if I achieve this, I'm going to be happy. Um, it's really also stressing the importance of like, you're not always going to be happy and to realize that you're going to be floating back and forth in and out of like, because you're always evolving. And so to really not be hard on yourself, when you are like, okay, I've achieved myself and maybe I'm not as happy as I thought I would be, but it's just understand it's not a one and done. You're going to, you're going to back, you're going to fall back. You're going to get back up. It's a, it's a, it's a dance you're doing with yourself. And just again, to the, for your mental health, don't, don't tell yourself something that's not true. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a huge point. And I mean, that's a, a big benefit of having mental health resources, because if you have a provider that can help you reframe those thoughts to where they're more in line with, you know, what it is that you're hoping for. That yeah. goes a long way to being healthier. So that's a, that's yeah. a great point. Naveen. Yeah. Naveen, that is like grittiness. What you just said right there. Brilliant. Yeah. I, I see that in you like grittiness to the nth degree, you know, have, having yeah. built your company over 20. Okay. I know you, I know how you feel about the words of affirmation. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not a words of affirmation girl. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I that's a great way to promote grittiness, which we, we all know that the grittier people are, the more resilient they're going to be, the more happy and healthy that they're going to be um, in their day to day lives. Yeah, There's sure. one question sure. I have, though, about like, I love what you said about the needs assessment and how it can be frustrating for employees when the, the you know, the employers aren't really addressing those needs. And I think that speaks to probably a little bit of the overwhelm maybe that HR professionals are experiencing, especially during post COVID that I don't like, and I would love to know if you feel like that's kind of gone back to pre COVID normal, or do, are you seeing like that there's still this significant sense of overwhelm of burden that these HR teams are having to carry um, with dealing with like the complexities of healthcare and wellness and all that? Like, what are you seeing there in terms of um, their workloads and burnout and how to manage all of these complexities. Yeah, well, while, while I can't speak specifically to what these HR teams may be experiencing day to day, I can tell you from my perspective, um, what I'm seeing with a lot of them is perhaps that feeling of overwhelm and a lot of it due to still being uh, short on staff um, or a lot of things have fallen into their lap that weren't an issue before. So we're seeing um, a lot of mental health issues in the workforce or, or now having to deal with hybrid workplaces and all of that can definitely add to that burnout that they're feeling. Um, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you if this is, I'm sure that they have had all of, a lot of these things on their plate prior to COVID, but I can just imagine like everyone else, they have seen an exacerbation in the types of uh, experiences that they're having on a regular basis because of the realities of living in that post pandemic world. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think COVID remarkable. really put a magnifying glass on it. And, you okay. know, even before then, you know, their job was the hardest job. And, you know, at MSU, our job is to make their job easier and to make them look good. Honestly, that's, that's the kind of, it's part of our mantra. And so um, really helping them to, you know, just kind of pull back, redirect, um, but also just to be there and support them in any way we can. Um, it's, it's challenging though. Their job is, a, it's a hard job. Being in HR, in HR is hard. Absolutely. So we give, we give them all credit. Yeah, absolutely. But I think you made a great point, Naveen, is for those HR teams out there that are struggling with overwhelm, how important it is to find great partners like MSU, mm -hmm. great wellness partners that can really be like your arm and your support yeah. so that you yeah. can really handle a lot of those complexities because they wear a lot of hats. So yeah. let some other folks who are experts in what they do, like Naveen and her team, they're experts in biometric screening delivery and in the data, uh, you know, after right. the fact, getting that data lean on them as much as possible and pass those hats onto those folks and to folks like Sandra 
who can really help support the, you know, the delivery um, of some of these ancillary wellness services so that, exactly. you know, you can reduce some of the overwhelm. Cool. Awesome. Cool. You guys, this is fun. Are you having fun? Yeah. Having fun. Absolutely. Yeah, it has been. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Great. I, you know, I, you I actually can, can very easily talk about this all day. I love, I love talking <laughs> yeah. about this. And so if you get me going, it's, you know, it's a good thing we've got a window. Otherwise, you, you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, I will yeah. tell you to, to add on to the support, like, you know, you know, being there and supporting the HR, I have to tell mm-hmm. you, and I have a lot of great um, clients throughout the whole spectrum. I have to tell you that Sandra is the one that whenever mm-hmm. I called, she always picked up the phone. Always. I always Aww. felt like I didn't have to put it off. I, did, I always felt like I didn't have to like, okay, I'll do that later. She always either picked up the phone or immediately responded with an answer or, Hey, I don't know where I'll get back to you. So I was, she, she supports me. I support them. It's really just a, you know, we're all under the same umbrella. So we're all yeah. trying to achieve the same goal. So I want to thank you, Sandra, for all your years and our relationship and our partnership and all of your support throughout all, all this time. Thank you. Thank you. And glad to have you in my life. Yeah. She's my little plant friend. We we do plant yeah. shopping. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that she likes plants. Yeah. She's got a beautiful we one. Love her her yeah. Well, and yeah. I think too, just from our conversation, Sandra, your passion for wellness and your deep expertise just really shines through. And I think yeah. that's so important because it's such a need right now. So many people are struggling with mental health challenges, with you know, living well, and there's just such a need there, such a gap. So having folks like you that can really provide that high level support and direction and really kind of champion and help educate employers on what's working and what's going to be effective for them and for their employees is so important. There's a really great testimonial that I was when I was reading your LinkedIn profile from a gentleman, Jack Spire. And he said, I cannot recommend Sandra highly enough. She is extremely knowledgeable in the wellness engagement arena. She's an excellent manager and she puts her heart into her job. She has strong customer relationship skills as well. I would definitely hire her if I had this type of position available. She's a delight to work with and have on the team. So I wanted to take a moment and share that. Uh, Kudos. Testimonial. (laughs) Yeah. And it totally seconds everything and supports everything Naveen just said to just about the wonderful work that you're doing and the service that you're providing to your clients. So bravo. She's a good one. Naveen I had to get my words of affirmation. To work nice with. Guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Well, let's talk about the future of wellness. Let's let's talk about how you see wellness programs evolving, especially with Gen Z coming up, right? We're definitely seeing, yeah. of course, this multi-generational workforce. You know, the boomers are booming. They're booming into retirement. And we've got Gen Z coming up. So how do you see um, the wellness programs evolving in the next five to 10 years? We talked about flexibility, but what are some other things yes. that you're seeing? Oh, well, I'm, I'm really excited about Gen Z. I have to say, you know, every day I get more and more excited about them because of the fact that they're just, they have this energy about them, you know, that they're, they're not letting anyone get in their way and they are going to change things. And I'm really, really excited to see what they have in store. Um, you know, I will say that one thing that I think they have made abundantly clear so far is that work-life balance is a priority for them. And so it's not just about money, you know, salary is great, but at the end of the day, if they're going to be getting paid a lot, but it's pulling them from the other important things in their life, it's just not going to be worth it to them. And so that's definitely notable um, in terms of when you're planning a a wellness program. And then Mm -hmm. the other thing that I think is really interesting about them is traditionally we've had this compartmentalization of wellness um, you know, we, we talk about financial wellness, we talk about uh, emotional wellness, social wellness, mental, mental wellness, physical. And so all of those things are the one and the same to them. You know, wellness is wellness. If financial That's wellness is not, is not good, their physical wellness isn't going to be good because some it's all interconnected. Yeah. Somehow. And so That's they're really smart. doing it. I'm That's sorry, so go ahead. I said, they're so smart. They just get it. They really are. They figured oh, it out. Please, too. please do not say that I have two Gen Zs. That are, <laughs> and I want to say they're millennials, but they do not know everything. You're not right about everything. Oh, they're, they're not watching. That's right, right? So hopefully. Hi, baby. Know. Hi, guys. Super <laughs> dies here. <laughs> they get smarter and smarter every generation, though, right? No, and they I, are. I, I will tell I you. I'm my 13-year-old, yeah. and I'm like, the things you know now that I didn't know until I was 20. 
you know, right. it's exposure. <laughs> it's exposure from yeah. an early age. They've just been exposed to all this yeah. new. T- I mean, the technology and innovation. They really are advanced. So, I do give my boys points. Yes, you you probably do more do <laughs> certain things, but I still know a lot. I still know a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, they. This has been their life for their entire lives. When did when was the internet? Like when did internet come on? The memer. Like we all remember like the screen coming up slowly. Yeah, they'll never know that. <laughs> 95 or something like that. But I love what you said yeah. there, Sandra, about the fact that they're seeing wellness holistically. And so that, yeah, yeah. that seems, you know, if, if as employers, as you're thinking about your wellness program, you have to make sure it's all encompassing because yeah. it needs to address all of those challenges in one whole rather than we're just going to do, you know, biometric screenings once a year. Well, what else, you know, what yeah, are you going to do yeah. to support that in these other areas and yeah. how can you package it as rather than having separate quadrants, it being all one combined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Em- employers definitely need need to step up um, as much as they're, you know, they're expecting their employees to. Uh, and I will say that because of that, you know, that getting doing away with that compartmentalization, um, even just traditional wellness programs as we know it, even if, if they are holistically approached, I'm I'm not sure that that's going to be enough for for the future. I think that it's really going to start being more of organizations having to have um, a whole cultural shift where they're holistically approaching or they're making their whole culture um, wellness oriented as opposed to just having a standalone wellness program. So that means that it's going to take a shift in hiring practices and salary and benefits offerings in how you um, do promotions and um, how you retain and, and keep your employees satisfied. All of that has to come into consideration. Um, and I think that we're going to probably see the, that start to happen. I mean, I, I, I'm already seeing some signs of it in the workplace. And I would imagine that it's just going to continue to to just be more enhanced. Yeah, I Very think that I, the groups would be remiss if they don't. I mean, yes, the Gen Zs, it's, you know, personalized and all that. But I think that you're going to miss your mark if you're you're, you're not inclusive, um, respecting oh, the yeah. diversity of your groups and the needs, you know, what their preferences are, their expectations, each generation, culture, background. I mean, this is they're the most inclusive generation thus far, and um, they're not going to stand for you know, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm on my pulpit a little bit here, but um, I think we really just need to not ignore what's really coming up, coming up for us. We need to, you know, take take heed of what they're saying to us. Yeah, I think so. that's such a great point. And how important diversity is for innovation, right? I mean, so oh, yeah. critical. And so making sure that you are building a culture where that diversity, that, you know, inclusiveness is yeah. is celebrated is so important yeah. for an organization in order for you to, to be Absolutely. a healthy culture and to innovate and yeah. to be you know relevant in the future ha- yeah have an open mind what do i Absolutely. always say adapt or die adapt, adapt or die, or die. <laughs> yeah that is your mantra Seriously. that <laughs> is adapt or die that's how i've survived since i'm 27 years yeah adapt or die so but yeah good point thanks I do have I just a follow up question about Sandra about this, what you were mentioning about how the wellness programs are going to, instead of being like a standalone, it's going to be kind of like incorporated into the whole culture of the organization. So do you see like a shift in incentive programs kind of going away? And how do you see, like you mentioned hiring specifically. So how do you see employers hiring differently with wellness in mind from a cultural perspective? Does that, does that question make sense? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I think what you're you're asking is really just kind of how are we making that sh- transition from how it currently is now to kind of what this yeah. what I'm envisioning in, in the future, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what I'm seeing really is just kind of being wellness being just a part of the conversation on a regular basis, as opposed to yeah. okay, let's have a wellness meeting now. Um, we talked about everything else. Now let's talk about mm-hmm. wellness. It's just. Right. It's just going to be inherently woven into that that fabric of that culture in the organization. Yeah. You won't need uh, a meeting. <laughs> you won't need a meeting. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's and so, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that you know when we're when we're thinking about organizational health, um, it, wellness programs as a standalone, they're great. They're great for what we've had in the past and where we are now. But we need to move towards just a overall healthy organizational culture, meaning that 
hiring practices, maybe not necessarily changing who we're hiring, um, or maybe, you know, we're looking to see if someone does fit that the culture in that organization, but more along the lines of, are we hiring in a way that's, that's, putting an additional mental burden on our, our candidates? You know, is this something that, do, do we need to sit through 12 rounds of interviews? Do we need to, you know, like these are the types of things that are all, part, you know, should be considered when you're thinking about organizational culture and, and organizational health. It's important to keep in mind that that starts from day one. And so for many of them, you know, before they even receive the offer, the, the, the employee or the candidate's perception of that employer is going to be created. So keeping that in mind, um, that's that's really what I meant with you know hi, something as some as uh, as simple as a hiring practice perhaps being influenced by a healthy organizational culture. I love that. That really clarifies and helps me um, understand it a little bit more. So as leaders and I, you know as a business owner, this is something that I you know, culture is so important to me. How can I create a culture of <laughs> acceptance, diversity, and really empathy, truly putting myself in their shoes to understand what it is that right. they need. So, you know, what I'm asking of them, there is reasonable and fair and, you know, they're not working all hours of the day and night and on the weekends and all those things. And that starts exactly. with leadership. Exactly. Yes. Because leaders, leaders are the ones who are setting that expectation for the teams. Yeah. So. And, and leading by example, once, you know, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. that's important mm -hmm. as well, because you can be saying one thing and then doing something ah. else. So, you know, one thing I've always kept in mind is if I'm telling my team to take time off and relax, I should be taking time off and relax as well, because otherwise they're not going to think it's okay to do that. They're going to think that mm -hmm. she's going to look at me differently if I ask for PTO, or if I'm telling them disconnect mm -hmm. at night or on the weekend, then they shouldn't be seeing an email come in at 10 o'clock at night or, you know, 4 a.m. or, uh, you know, anytime on Saturday and Sunday, because basically I'm doing something completely opposite of what I'm telling them to do. And so making sure that all of those things really align and that you are doing your best to be a good <laughs> leader that way. Can I say, are you laughing? I, yeah, so me too. Funny. I'm sitting listening to her going, okay, yeah, I told Jasmine not to work this weekend, but oh, three o'clock in the morning on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank it's you, hard. Sandra. It is. It is. It's hard. Uh, right. Can you say what well, as a business owner? It is yeah. so, but but on the other side of it as a business we owner. We need to walk reality. the walk. We need to walk the walk. We do. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. Of course. That's what I'm here for. Mental <laughs> check. Mental yeah. check. Thank yeah. you. All right. Yeah. I have to say I've been guilty of like the 10 o'clock at night Sunday emails and I'm just like, yeah. I want to get this out so I can start well, fresh they on a do, they, Exchange has that little thing of like, hey, would you like to send this during normal business hours? I'm like, no, because it's not what I want it out. But I think I need to say yes. <laughs> yes. Let me, just, let me get yeah. it done. Okay. That yeah. scheduling option is a game changer. You know, you can okay. you can get that out of your system at 10 o'clock at night, but then right. have it delivered yeah. at 8 a.m. Yeah. in the morning where it's, You're you know, right. a little bit more reasonable for your team. Right. Yeah, I've started okay. to do that more and more. I just need to consistently do it every single time. So, right. Sandra, thank you. Good on that. I feel, You're welcome. I feel awesome. like I, yeah, I'm humbled. Humbled <laughs> and I'm grateful. <laughs> well, this has been Great. like such an amazing conversation. I mean, we could just talking all, we could just talking. I obviously we can't keep, keep talking because I can't talk. <laughs> it's time, <laughs> it's time for lunch, people. Time for I lunch. know. This has been such a wonderful conversation. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you, Sandra, and just everything that you're sharing, your wisdom, your insights, your experience, your expertise is so valuable for any of our manufacturers out there listening, any leaders in organizations you know, do you have any final words for them on what they can be doing? Maybe they're new to wellness and they don't know how to put together their wellness program. What would be your final thoughts, recommendations for those folks out there who are looking to invest or maybe expand? What should they do? Final Absolutely. Thoughts? I, you know, I, I know I mentioned it earlier, but I'll, I'll just reemphasize that point now where, you know, make sure that you figure out what your organizational goals are. You want to have a clearly defined set of expectations for what those mm -hmm. outcomes are. Um, and then start with start with data collection. It's important to have a benchmark and and have a have a place where you're starting so that you can figure out whether or not the initiatives that you're actually implementing are working or not. That's that's going to be huge. And so um, even if you don't think that it's data that you necessarily want to start measuring right now, 
I would start collecting it if you can, because that's going to be important in the future for any future wellness programs that you may have. And maybe right now your focus is going to be on mental health because that's what your employees are are really um, are asking for. And maybe you're seeing a trend in in behavioral health claims and and uh, pharmacy spend that kind of really emphasizes that as well. So that's something that you could focus on now, but maybe down the road you want to focus on uh, different different things like maybe it's driving uh, people away from the emergency room because they're overutilizing the emergency room instead of going to their doctor. So just make sure that you're keeping that in mind when you're collecting your data. Um, collect as you know m- much robust data as you can. You know what what gets measured gets managed. So that's kind of my my goal. My main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my final would be the you know again tapping into the you know the needs assessment you know, being flexible, mm-hmm. inclusive approach. And then, you know, just really schedule your biometrics. Every generation needs a baseline. And that is it. Yeah. <laughs> We're <laughs> right. I mean, that is like the foundation. Truthfully, yeah. that is the foundation of everything. You need to have that baseline. You need to understand. It's a, yeah, it's a foundation and a part of it. There's so much more out there that just brings it all together. So I'm glad to be a part of the team. I'm glad to always have been part of Sandra's team and in the future as well. So thank you so much, Sandra. For everything. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You. Nicole, Thank you. you're amazing. You're amazing, Nicole. I always love my oh. interactions with you. It's always so fun. Naveen and I were like soul sisters, I swear. <laughs> we got a great comment from Kevin Thompson. He is a dear friend of mine. He owns a wonderful company in Alaska called Mountain Dog, and he sells these amazing the freeze-dried salmon dog treats. So Kevin, thanks so much for coming on the show here. He says he Thank loves you, the golden expectations. So I think that's really great. Kevin is a business owner, so he's thinking about these same you know, things I'm sure with his team. So you guys, this has been so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Sandra, will you come back? You'll come back. Absolutely. (laughs) Let me know. Just say the word. I'll be back. (laughs) Thank you. We could do like deep dives. We can do further deep dives on mental health. Anyways, we'll talk about that later. Everyone's got to go. Lunch hour is over. So we'll talk soon. Thanks, you guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. You guys can stay on.